Right. So, as I, as I said before, I'm just going to say again, it was really hard to choose which bits to concentrate on today. Uh, we might have another opportunity another time, who knows, to go back and fill in some of the gaps. Um, so the next bit that I've chosen is mainly because it was the one, it was the bit that I personally found the most fascinating and dealing with a text and an issue that I was least familiar with. Mm. So I decided to share that with you. Um, and so that's the section uh, beginning on page 80. <coughs> beginning on page 80, with the big heading, The work of the righteous is greater than the work of creation of the heavens and of the earth. Okay. Now, in the, in the pages before this, he has been speaking about the themes of repentance and return to origins. Repentance, which is our turning back to God, but the deeper, broader sense of repentance, which is the idea which has deep roots in Judaism um, and possibly in Christianity as well, of the ultimate return of all to the one. So everything emerges from the one and will ultimately turn back to the one. And so he's, he's said quite, had quite a lot to say about that and different texts to talk about um, he's talked about the idea of, um, of God lowering himself, humbling himself in the process of creation and redemption and the parallel with the Christian idea of kenosis, of God emptying himself out in the incarnation. But, um, yeah, we're going to take it up, pick it up at this point. One of, the, one of the things that Pierre Lenhardt does is always begin a section before he begins it, which, which confused me a bit at first, and I worked out what he was doing, and he always does it. So before the heading, um, he, he gives you a little lead-in to the, to the next topic um, at the end of the previous section. And I think this is all part of his predilection for the chariza, for mm -hmm. stringing things together and showing how everything is connected. So there's never a kind of definite ending of one section and beginning of the other section. Instead, they kind of blend into one another. So, um, so we're going to begin with the little paragraph just beyond, just, just before, rather, that heading, in order to enter more. I don't know. Do you remember where we got up to going around? It was you. Okay, lovely. In order to enter more into the mystery of the divine unity and of the mercy that characterizes his unity at the origin of the creation of the world, it is good to follow the steps of the righteous who bring creation back to its origin. The work of the righteous is greater than the work of creation of the heavens and of the earth. We shall begin with the saying by Balthazar that causes us to reflect on the role of the righteous in the redemption of the world. This ancient saying, contemporary with the establishment of the New Testament, was taken up again by the Hasidic masters, whose message we shall study. These masters at the end of the 18th century are much later than Bar Kapara. The gap in time does not take anything away from the pertinence of these masters who have to their credit that they understood and lived in depth the spiritual traditions that they transmit. I acknowledge that in choosing these texts, I am inspired by the resonances with the Christian faith in Jesus Christ, the righteous and the redeemer par excellence. Such as they are, these texts are independent of the Christian faith, and listening to them in no way means that Christians take possession of their message. We shall return to these resonances later. That Kapara is one of the last Tanaim. Yes, uh, Tanaim is a, a group of rabbis, the rabbis who flourished between approximately the year 70 when the temple was destroyed and 
um, the end of the Mishnah, which was in around 220. So it covers the late 1st century, all of the 2nd century, and into the 3rd century. And that's called the Tanaitic period, and the rabbis of that time are called Tanaim. It literally means those who teach by repetition. And it's linked to the word Mishnah, which is the rabbinic law code that emerged out of that period and was the first canonical rabbinic writing, a sort of concise statement of the oral of the oral law. Yeah? Okay? So Tanaim, this group of rabbis. A student of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi at the beginning of the third century. So Yehuda Hanasi was the editor of the Mishnah. He was the great figure that Nasi means patriarch or prince. He was the kind of chief rabbi of the time, and it was through his authority uh, and uh, preeminence that the Mishnah was brought together and uh, became a canonical text that was thereafter uh, commented on and discussed and became the basis of the Talmud. Yeah? So Bar Kapara was part of that final generation of Tanaim. And, uh, as he'll go on to say, a very colourful and challenging character. Uh, Kapara said, the work of the righteous is greater than the work of the heavens and of the earth. For concerning the creation of heavens and of the earth, it is written, certainly my hand bounded the earth, my right hand stretched out the heavens, whereas concerning the work of the righteous, it is written, the place that you, Lord, made your dwelling place, the sanctuary that your hand prepared. The statement by Brian Barkapara is typical of his master, who disconcerted people both by his message and by the way in, in which he based it in Scripture. Certainly, in his recourse to Scripture, he is not using Scripture as proof, but as a support. Thanks to Rashi, we can accept your hands in Exodus 17, 17 are not the hands of God, but the hands of the righteous. Moses is our Lord, Solomon, children of Israel, who built the dwelling place in the desert in the temple in Jerusalem in accordance with the word of God. This interpretation of scripture is not necessary or convincing, for it is significant that Rashi finds support from the same verse in Exodus 17. Let's just pause there for any clarification that's needed before we go on with the interpretation. Um, so, um, yeah, there is, a, there is a couple of misprints here, incidentally, when it says Exodus 17, 17, it means 15, 17. Uh -huh. Somehow that's a mistake. That's, uh, that's uh, towards the conclusion of um, the Song of the Sea. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's Moses' song of the Red Sea. It says, um, yeah. uh, and then it concludes the Lord will reign forever and ever um, so the, the key there is um, Bakapara commenting on scripture points out that it talks about God's hand creating the heavens and the earth okay and we know hand is a metaphor we don't have to worry uh, yeah, but God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, but when it comes to the temple or the tabernacle, it also says God created that. God's hand. The link there is the word hand. Yeah, of course the rabbis always link things based on the same word being used. So the link is hand, and God's hand is credited with making the sanctuary. 
But God, did God build the sanctuary? No, human beings built the sanctuary. Yeah? Moses built the one in the wilderness, Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but nevertheless, it's called, called um, God's hand. And what's the difference between my hand founded the earth, etc., and the sanctuary created by God's hand? Because he's saying that the work of the righteous, those who create the sanctuary, is greater than the creation of heaven and earth. What is there in that passage that tells you that the creation of the sanctuary is greater? So that doesn't hasn't come across really clearly. Yes, you got it. That's it. Yeah, because it's God's dwelling place. Yes. I mean, we could, of course, you can discuss that and say, well, surely God dwells in the heavens and the earth as well. But, but the idea that that there can be a specific dwelling place for God's presence on earth, and that is made not by God, but by human beings, but it's still called God's hand. Yeah? So that is even greater than the creation of heaven and earth. Obviously, it's a, meant paradoxically right from the beginning. Uh, it's the kind of thing that is said to startle, and to surprise, and to make you think. And as he says, that's the kind of thing Barakapara enjoyed doing. He was quite mischievous, Barakapara. Um, and uh, so this was a passage I, I, I wasn't really that familiar with before, and, and I very much enjoyed being introduced to this and the way in which he then pursues it and the explanations that are given. Let's see how it's pertinent. Okay, any other clarification needed there before we go on? What happens now we don't have the temple? Ah, that's something he's going to discuss at great length later on. Uh, yeah, um, so that, that is to come. Yeah. Okay. And that, that word scripture is the prophets, the writings. I was just interested that. Mm uses that word scripture for what we would call the, the Hebrew Bible. Oh yes, scripture here is uh, one verse from Isaiah and one verse from Exodus mm -hmm. and um, uh, the um, where, where, where's the word scripture that you're looking at? In the second line. Scripture. scripture, yes, so it means, it means the, the Tanakh, yeah. the Hebrew Bible, yes. Yeah, I mean it's it, yeah, yeah. So no. um, so yeah, and then the other little that's right. The other the other tricky distinction he's drawing there, which is a very rabbinic one, is between a text from scripture that actually proves something, and a text from scripture that merely supports mm. an interesting idea, mm. because methodologically they're two different categories, two different ways of using scripture. When it comes especially to anything legal. Things need to be proven from Scripture to be part of the law, because you need to know for certain that this is this is the law, this is God's will, and this is proven by a verse from Scripture. But when it comes to homiletical ideas like this, you don't need a, a proof. It's enough just to find a support, or as Margaret called it, a hint from Scripture. Yes. But yeah. is anything to do with fulfilled? Not, not here. I don't think that's... Particularly relevant here. Yeah. The Jewish way of saying that is to lend support. The rabbinic way of saying it is to uphold. That's right. Uh, we're looking at an app that Kasha has over lunch about with all the places that fulfill comes in the Bible, both in Hebrew and in Greek, and what words are used. But it means so many different things there. It doesn't mean fulfill in the in the gospel sense, this this was done to fulfil what is written. So it's hard to draw exact parallels with the Hebrew from the Hebrew scriptures. Of course, fulfil there mean, can mean to complete a period of time or something like that. So it's different words are used. Sorry, that's complicated. Right, let's go on to show the pertinence. In order to show this pertinence, I would like to study mm -hmm. one text from the Babylonian Talmud and three texts from the Hasidic Master. The fact that I find support in these Hasidic texts is more influenced by the New Testament than by ancient rabbinic literature. I do not have the right to make the ancient Jewish texts 
say what I hear in the New Testament about Jesus Christ, but I do believe that I can call upon Jewish teachings that are rooted in the message of Bar Kabbalah and that are based on traditions from ancient mysticism, the most ancient we can know. The Merkabah or Hethalot traditions that were known and lived by St. Paul and Rabbi Akiva. Okay, that's again, that's a little bit complicated. Um, Merkava means chariot, it's the exposition of the chariot vision of Ezekiel uh, and all the mystical teaching that people found in that. And Hechalot means um, uh, temples or palaces. And these are texts uh, from ancient times. The dating of them is very difficult. Generally, they'd be dated between the 2nd century and about the 6th century, but that's a long period of time and nobody's sure. Um, Is that BCE or CE? CE, CE. Um, and they're texts which speak about mystical meditative practices that would lead a person to um, on a kind of spiritual journey or a spiritual ascent through the various heavenly levels towards an ultimate vision of God or a vision of God's throne. Um, and, and these are very, very colourful mystical texts full of mysterious names and terrifying guardian figures and uh, complicated formulas that you have to memorise in order to proceed from one level to the next. Uh, and they're quite marginal in some ways. They're not part of mainstream Jewish teaching. But many scholars believe that um, echoes of these texts are there in the Talmud, um, in stories told about the rabbis, and that these, these texts actually come from a living mystical tradition active in the time of the Talmud, of the ancient rabbis. Um, it's a bit controversial, not everybody would agree with that, but it's it's quite often held nowadays. Um, he makes the additional claim that these were known and lived by St. Paul, yeah, yeah, which is taking it back into the first century. Yeah. Which bit of St. Paul are we thinking of there? Is that the bit about, I was in my body or I wasn't in my body? I wasn't yeah, sure, even that was about the Yes, I was I was snatched up into the fourth heaven. The fourth heaven is it? I think it's, no, he doesn't. Does he say seventh? I think he says the fourth heaven. Uh, I don't think he goes quite as high as the seventh. But I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Uh, um, and um, yeah, and um, so yes, this ascension experience, a spiritual ascent, um, and so yeah. Maybe it, maybe it was around. The texts had, had, have gone through a long process of corruption and reworking. They were only preserved in medieval manuscripts in Germany and so forth and so forth. And they've only been studied intensively, really, in the last few decades. Um, so, what, so what he's claiming is that although the canonical rabbinic texts, the well-known ones, the Talmud and so forth, um, reflect a kind of mainstream rabbinic agenda that isn't particularly mystical. These other texts reflect a much more intense mystical kind of activity of meditation and fasting and praying with the object of mystical experience, mystical vision, and, um, and that these are so close in spirit to St. Paul and to the New Testament the traditions based on them, that is, later Jewish mysticism, like the Hasidic literature, has a deep inner kinship with Christian teaching, mm -hmm. with Christian ideas. Mm -hmm. That's quite a controversial claim, and it's, it's kind of, you know, crossing huge historical sort of vistas of time with not very much proof about it, but, you know, it, it, it's not... I'm not, I'm not saying it, it's therefore unsupportable, um, and, uh, but it's a scholarly choice to say this is the way I understand that history, and that's fair enough. Okay, um, sorry about the lengthy explanations, but I think you can easily get lost otherwise in some of these. Okay, let's go on to the next page, 82. 
The Talmud transmits a series of right? Yes. A series of traditions on Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, a student of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai. He was a respected master who was known for his close relationship with God and his power to work miracles. Upon the request of his wife, he obtained a miracle from God, and then a second miracle, which annulled the first in order to satisfy a second request by his wife. <laughs> Concerning this, the Talmud pass, passes on an authorised commentary on two successive miracles. Mm -hmm. Eighty Talmud 225 a the Talmud taught the last miracle was greater than the first. The following is in our notes. We have learned through tradition that what has been given is given, and what has been received is not taken back. The expression that Hannah taught is often used in the Babylonian Talmud. It introduces an authorized commentary on the tradition that precedes it. Through a miracle, God had taken back a gift that God had given through a miracle. Tradition teaches that in this case, the second miracle is greater than the first because God does not take back what God has given us. The teaching will be taken up again in the following text to speak about the first great miracle, the miracle of the creation of the world, the second miracle, that of the decreation of the world, which occurs through the deeds of the righteous. Sorry. You can see why I found this <laughs> fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Brenda? So we're up to the middle of page 80, middle of page 82. Uh, this is where it says Dov Bear of Mezrich. Dov Bear of Mezrich, he'll probably say this, but I'll say it first, is, um, was the second leader of the Hasidic movement. The Hasidic movement, which was a great spiritual revival and renewal movement in the 18th century, um, it got underway around 1740 with the activity of Israel Baal Shem Tov. Very important central figure of early Hasidism, and he died in 1760. So, 20 years of activity with many disciples who were attracted to this new um, sort of popular mysticism that he that he taught, which was very much about emphasizing joy, emphasizing the presence of God in all creation, even in the lowliest things, and the way in which everything can be made holy. Uh, through using creation for holy purposes, and especially through the work of the tzaddik, the righteous man, who is seen as a kind of bridge between God and humanity, between heaven and earth. Um, I don't think he mentions it here, but one of the key, <clears throat> one of the key uh, verses for Hasidism is a verse from the Tanakh, I think it's from Proverbs, that says, Tzaddik yesod olam, the tzaddik, the righteous person, is the foundation of the world. And Hasidism takes this very, kind of literally, to be speaking about a saintly person, a saintly leader, who is the, the foundation of our life on earth, through whom we can connect to God. The tzaddik in Hasidism is a kind of guru figure. Mm -hmm. So you become a disciple of a tzaddik, uh, of a righteous, uh, saintly person, uh, and follow their way of life and listen to their teachings, attach yourself to them as much as possible, and that's your link to God. And if you think that sounds not like what you're used to in Judaism, you're right, because it's very <laughs> unlike other forms of Judaism. And it's much more like uh, Sufism, where you attach yourself to the Sheikh, or Hinduism, where you attach yourself to the Guru, uh, or some forms of Christianity, where you attach yourself to Jesus, or maybe to another intercessory figure, saint, blessed virgin, the Pope, who knows? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, uh, so you've got this human bridge between God and creation. And it's important to understand that to make sense of this. Now, Dov Bear of Mezrich was the preeminent disciple of Israel Bar Shem Tov and, and succeeded him as the leader of the whole movement when the Baal Shem Tov died in 1760. Um, after Dov Bear of Mezrich, he's called the Great Magid, which means the Great Preacher. He's renowned for his preaching. Um, after he died, the movement then split up into many different branches with different leaders 
all across Eastern Europe, and we still have many different Hasidic groups or schools with different customs, different approaches. But, but the, the leader of all of them in that early period was Dov Bear of Mesrich. And there was a question Can I just came. Say that at exactly the same time as this, exactly the same time as this, John Wesley started his teaching and Jonathan Edwards in the States, the same sort of mysticism and spirituality. That's right, and not only that, but there were the quietists in France, in the Catholic Church in France, who taught a kind of mystical approach of surrender to God, um, and uh, and there were there were the Moravian brethren in Germany who taught a kind of yeah. mystical pietism. So there's this wave in the 18th century. There's a wave of mystical pietism that swept across Europe. That, it happened in the Russian Orthodox Church as well, which is, of course, in the same area as many of the early Hasidim. Um, and um, right, so, so Ro- the Moravians in the States as well. Yeah, so um, Ronald Knox, the great Monsignor Ronald Knox, wrote his great work called Enthusiasm, which was about this wave of mysticism that swept through Europe in the, in the sort of mid-18th century. Um, I don't think he included Hasidism because he was only talking about Christianity, but it's, some people see it as part of the same phenomenon. Thank you, Kay. Yeah. Right, so let's read what he has to say. The works of the righteous are greater than the works of creation, of heaven and of the earth. Explanation. For the work of the heavens and of the earth was being from nothing. No, you need to include the brackets okay. here. Yeah. Was to make being from nothing. Yes, me, ayin. Yes, me, ayin, yes. Yeah. Whereas the righteous make nothing from being, me, ayin. For based on everything that they do, even material things such as eating, they raise up holy sparks from that eating to the highest. And thus they do with everything. Thus it happens that they make nothing from being. Okay, let's let's pause there just to just to absorb that. This is a it's it's fascinating. Yeah. You really need to know a little bit of the Kabbalistic background to this to make to really understand it. Because so the traditional philosophical term, if you look at Philosophers like Maimonides and so forth speak about creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. Yeah, that that there was absolutely nothing except God, but and then out of that nothing, God miraculously brought about being. Yesh something me'ayin from nothing. Okay. Now, when the mystics got hold of this in the sort of 13th century onwards, they radically changed. The understanding of it, because the tradi- the philosophical understanding was nothing means just nothing, yeah, and then God causes something to appear, yeah. Um, but the mystics said no, the nothing from which the something appears is God. It's not that creation comes after just non-existence; its creation comes out of God. It's this is a Platonic idea that everything emanates from the One. Anyone who knows a bit about Platon, Neoplatonism, so it comes from from that. It's the idea that God is the nothing. Now, how can you call God nothing? <laughs> Sounds a bit disrespectful. <laughs> yeah, it's because the the, 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 the Kabbalists say if this world is something, then God is nothing. But if God is something, then this world is nothing. In other words, the point is the only true being is God's being. Everything else is a derivative of God's being. Yeah? But if we focus on the end result, on our physical world and everything we know, and say, well, this is something, then it's so different from God's being that God, in comparison, is called nothing. In other words, not any of that, something completely different. Yeah? But then if, we, if, as the mystics want us to do, we refocus away from this physical world 
onto God and God becomes the something, then everything else fades away into nothing because everything is revealed to be nothing but God. Okay? It's deep stuff, okay? Um, it, 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 it sort of uh, it blends into something that he discusses later on called panentheism, that everything is within God. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's what the the, the Magid of Mezrich, Dov Bear, uh, is taking the teaching of Bar Kapara that what the righteous do is even greater than what God does, and he's turning that around in a Kabbalistic way and saying why? Because God makes something from nothing, but the the, the righteous make nothing from something. So from the something of this world, from all the physical stuff of this world, if I use this table to sit and study holy texts at, then the innermost spark of divinity that gives this table existence is somehow refined out of the substance of the table and reunited with its source in God. This relates to other Kabbalistic stories about the the way in which the God's light becomes shattered and, and, and scattered and spread thinly throughout all the physical existence. And the aim is to sort it out again, called birur in Hebrew, sorting out all the divinity so that it all becomes reunified. God, as it were, is sent into countless exiled sparks, just as human beings, just as the Jews were sent into countless exiled people all scattered around. And just as the people must ultimately be gathered in and reunited and restored, so God too needs to be gathered in and reunited and restored to primordial oneness. And that's what redemption means for the Kabbalists and for the, for the Hasidim. It's, that it's not just our restoration, but God's restoration of unity. Um, and how does that come about? through the righteous, that's what we're saying. It needs us, obviously the great righteous people, the special ones, but everybody else can be part of that too. If you use things, especially with right intention and for holy purposes, the food that you eat, the things that you use, the clothes that you wear, everything you interact with in the world can be kind of purified and refined and uplifted so that the inner divinity becomes more manifest the division becomes secondary. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is a Kabbalistic approach. So that's what he's talking about here. That's how he explains the, the teaching of Bar Kapara. Is that when you say the Alpha? Well, that's a Christian terminology, of course, that, um, that Christ is that's from Revelation. Christ is Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Um, um, but yes, I, you can see a similarity. I don't. I, I can't sort of follow no, follow it through fully now. Um, and of course, that gets reflected really beautifully in Tayyad de Chardin when he when he uh, and I think in, in quite a Jewish kind of way as well. Although I think he's mainly inspired by Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but Tayyad de Chardin talks about Christ as Omega Man, which represents the not not so much just you know God manifest, but humanity raised up and perfected to its final purpose, it's, its true essence. Repairing the world. Yes, it's a kind of repairing the world. But it's part of that, that idea, especially prevalent in Eastern theology, um, that um, the true meaning of Jesus isn't so much Jesus' death on the cross, important though that obviously is for all Christians, but is, is the transfiguration, is the raising up of humanity to divinity. It's that point where humanity and divinity meet. So yeah, similar kinds of ideas. Yeah. That's, redem that's redemption then, isn't it? That's what you've been saying, gathering all these spontaneous. That is a Jewish way of looking at redemption. That's a specifically Hasidic way Hasidic yeah, of Hasidic. looking at, yes, but very Jewish, yes. Based on Kabbalistic te teaching, yeah. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lovely, it's a, it's a beautiful kind of spirituality. Yes, yes. Yeah. We've all got a part to play. Nobody's out of the picture. Nothing is out of the picture. 
Okay, let's, um, yeah, so let's take it a bit further, pursue this and see where, where he goes with it. The Mugged Bases, he's going. disciples, especially Abraham Aliska, applied his message to spiritual life and taught that if the human person links him or her and herself, nothing before God, and follows the Torah for the good of his and her neighbor, they attain their own unification and that of their community. Okay, uh, yeah, let's, let's take it a bit further. We're, we're get, getting into really interesting and not well-known texts here. Um, and yeah, let's, let's take it a bit further on page 83. If you're stuck and you have something that is really incomprehensible, just say it and I'll do my best to explain. <laughs> is anybody stuck in that way just now? Okay, 83. Rabbi Mishulam Aibush Hela of Tarlet, died 1795, a disciple of Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Peren Fremishlani, yeah. <laughs> who was himself a disciple of Rabbi Israel Benyam Eliezer, Baal Shel Tov, and of Rabbi Elion Mike, Michael, the Maggid of Tzlokol. Excuse my pronunciation. It's no <laughs> Kasha can found. correct your Polish. <laughs> <laughs> It's known for his profound interpretations of the teachings of Rabbi Dov Beer, the great Magid. When we recognize that in truth we are nothing, and when we take into account that there is nothing in the world except the name, blessed be he, as it was before the creation, then there is for the name, blessed be he, if one can say this, real enjoyment which he expects us to give him. This is like a father and a mother who hope to give birth to a son and to carry him in their arms. Thus, there is for the name, blessed be he, an enjoyment that comes to him from his sons when they come into his arms in order to embrace him and to attach themselves to him as has been said above. This is what was said. The work of the righteous is greater than the work of creation of the heavens and of the earth. And Rabbi Dovbeyer, the man of God, said, Because the work of the heavens and of the earth was a derivation of being coming from nothing, a descent from the superior to the inferior, whereas the righteous, through their works, stripped themselves of their materiality and always think of the name, blessed be he. They see, understand, and become truly aware of the fact that this materiality is in a sense nothing, as it was in God before creation. Thus they cause being to go up again to nothing and to go up from the inferior to the superior. This is more marvellous than to make to go down from the superior to the inferior. As was said in the Gemara, in the name of Rabbi Hanina ben Dossa, the last miracle is greater than the first, for what was given by the heavens is given and not taken back. Okay, so you can see here how it, this is why he introduced all these strange little texts earlier to lead us into how these Hasidic masters bring all these texts together and weave them together to create a coherent spiritual picture of this concept of the great return. You know, there's the great outflowing from God, but ultimately that's for the purpose of having a great return to God. But that turning point, when the outflowing turns back to the, to the in-gathering, 
isn't just done by God, it's done by the righteous. Yeah? And that's that's the turning point. Um, yes. So yeah, God God gives out, but only we bring about that greater we, the righteous, the very righteous, bring about that greater miracle of making what was given out to be taken back again. That's really challenging ideas. Okay? I hope that comes across. Another bit. And concerning this, Rav, a holy master, Menachim Mendel of Helen Mashiach, said, Thus one must, must explain the verse from Psalm 90, Lord, you have been a shelter for us from generation to generation. This means that we, our souls, were in the main, blessed be he, before creation. Only one thing is now necessary, from Psalm 90 again, that you make the human person return to his dust. And that may each person strip himself of his materiality in order to return to the name, blessed be he, in his thinking, as in the beginning. Okay. All right. Um, now, I just wonder if we can... I think we might... I think at this point, we've got the point there, he, does, he adds further depth to it, but I think we can um, skip a little bit, just in the interest of time, and um, turn to page 85, 85, in the middle of the page, so as to show how this matter is of interest. Yeah, that's, so applying, what, applying this I teaching to our issue of the unity of the Trinity and our understanding. Okay. Mark, can I just say that that interpretation of Psalm 90, verse 3, that you have made the human person return to his dust. Yes. Um, and then he says, um, each person strips himself of his materiality in order to return to the name. For me, that's quite a big insight, because mm -hmm. this return to the dust... <laughs> We, we often used to use that on Ash Wednesday, and I think it used to mean, you know, we will die. Mm -hmm. But that's a, lo that's a very nice human way of returning to the dust, mm -hmm. because you're still alive. Yes, <laughs> yes, well, that's, that's right. I think, maybe that's my interpretation. Am I mistaken in thinking that the, he's only quoted a bit of that verse, yes. because it's you turn man back to dust and you say, return, O children of men. Um, and so the returning to dust, in other words, the stripping away of our material bodies, enables us to return, which is the, the, ret the spiritual return of our souls to God where they originated. Yeah. But I think and what you're saying is right. I'm just reaffirming what you said. But yes, it is looking. It is looking at it a different way. Yeah. yeah. No material resurrection. Thank you. Well, no, because the uh, Judaism, traditional Judaism, and certainly Hasidism, very strongly teaches that there's a physical resurrection. Yeah. So how you reconcile all of that is another matter we can't do. Right? We will talk about resurrection later, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, where were we? Okay, so. Um, yeah, so just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's do a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as to show. <laughs> so as to show how this matter is of interest, let us already give the example of the gift of manna that is recounted in the book of Exodus. Scripture and tradition see in the gift of the manna a prodigious act, a miracle work by God who through this gift wants to test Israel's faith and its obedience in practicing the Shabbat Sabbath, a day blessed and sanctified by the Lord. The miracle is worked by God himself and not by Moses, which comes out clearly in Scripture, and which Jesus notes in the Gospel according to John, the miracle is manifest so that Israel might witness to it after having seen it, with or without the support of the vision of the 
Goma portion at Mana that is placed before the testimony in the tent of meeting. The hidden miracle which flows from the manifest miracle is that of all nourishment of every bread that is produced through Israel's work, which is brought to God through the established blessing. Jesus Christ introduces himself as manna, as the bread of life. Through the hidden miracle of the presence of Jesus Christ in the bread of, and wine of the Eucharist, the Christian, in a real sense, already lives eternal life. John. Do you want me to go Just on? the last bit, yes, thanks. Yes. This makes it possible for us to shed light on that, on what, according to Christian faith, can be said about the manifest miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and of the hidden miracle of the resurrection of Je in Jesus Christ of the Christians who believe in him. Do you want me to go on still? One more, yeah. For the last line? Yes, please. For Jews, as for Christians, there is also the hidden miracle of the sinner who has repented and been forgiven and who has become greater than the righteous who has not sinned. Okay. Oh, right, there's a lot, <laughs> a lot in there, isn't there? Yeah. So, yeah, this is where, yeah, it, it, he, it's difficult because he's alluding to so many things, some of which he only really uh, develops in the appendix. This, this distinction which comes from 13th century Jewish scholar Nachmanides between he, he revealed miracles and hidden miracles. So revealed miracles are the miraculous things that everybody knows are miracles, yeah? Um, like manna coming from heaven. The hidden miracle is that bread grows from the earth, you know, that, that food grows from the earth. We might say, oh, that's just nature, that's not a miracle. But the whole point, he's, he's arguing, based on Nachmanides, that the whole point of the revealed miracles of bread coming straight from heaven is to show us that all our nourishment is miraculous. Mm -hmm. That it's all miracle, it's all God's creation, it's all that sort of whirling of existence from non-existence, yeah? Um, and that's what he means by the hidden miracles, just everyday things, but if we penetrate beyond the scientific surface, we can see that there's a miracle in everything. Um, and so then, yes, there's the, the, the revealed miracle for Christians of Jesus' resurrection and the hidden miracle of each individual's inner spiritual resurrection, the life that comes for Christians through Christ. And then he rather abruptly and surprisingly links it up at the very bottom there to a Jewish idea, a famous statement in the Talmud, um, in the place where the repentant sinner stands, even the completely righteous person cannot stand. Now what does that mean, do you think? In the place where the repentant sinner stands, even the holy righteous person cannot stand. It's making a big assumption that there is anybody who is that righteous, but that, that's, you know, yeah. In a sense, because they've come through a trial, they've come yeah, through something yeah, and they're thinking something. In the sense that the person who has repented uh, has gone through some evil misdemeanor, whatever, and has repented and has gone again, so he's added something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's like the, um, the phrase, you know, phrase. There's, there's, there's more rejoicing in heaven over what one sinner who's repented than over a hundred who never needed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very much like that. It's phrased yeah. in the footnote. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anybody else? Okay, yeah, so, so that's all right. That's all exactly it. Um, the, the Talmud depict, and, and later Jewish theology based on it depict re repentance not simply as repenting for a sin and saying sorry and resolving not to do it again and returning to the right way, but, but looks at the, the inner energy within that process as something completely transformative um, that has brought you to, as you say, a new level of 
of being. Um, and uh, oh, I could go on and on about that. I, I wrote an article for Siddiq years and years ago about this. Yeah. Siddiq, the old, um, yes, yes. Um, Siddiq was. Anyway, um, uh, and so, that, so repentance as a positive, transformative energy that, that doesn't just restore things to, to a kind of average, but actually lifts things up further onto a higher level. Um, okay, so that's, um, yeah, interesting. Yes. Okay, I think now... I wonder if it's time to have a mini break. Um, mini, uh, yeah, okay. Um, he goes on and on about miracles, and I don't want to. I don't want to read that bit. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's get to the let to the, get to the conclusion of this section then which comes on page 90. Do you have that? Yes, you do. Yes. Let's, uh, let's just start from the paragraph in the middle of the page to conclude this stage, uh, to conclude this stage. Kasha, would you read this one? To conclude this stage, we hear that the righteous Faraday work of decreating the world caused human beings and the world to return to the divine nothing, which causes all the walls of hatred and division to disappear. Union with God is attained by the negative way. For Christians, Jesus is the righteous par excellence, who confirms the work of the righteous. Of all the righteous. Yeah. Of all the righteous. He is the abridged word who recapitulates the whole creation. He is the Alpha and the Omega, <laughs> the reality of Shabbat, as Father Hanilia Lubak dared to say. Now we must receive the message from the Sabbath. Right. Thank you. So, so you see here where he's heading with this, all of this stuff about the righteous, the work of the righteous, decreating, bringing everything back to God, for Christians, it, it culminates with the work of Jesus, the tzaddik, the righteous one, par excellence. Do you mean restructuring? Decreating hurts me. It's the creation that hurts me. It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the divine. Can we say restructuring? Is it restructuring? Well, you can say what you want, but uh, you know, <laughs> if, if it makes if it makes it better for you. But but he's very very deliberately using this, and, and this is what he explained before: the creating is the emergence of something from nothing, but the ultimate goal is the return of that something to nothing. Nothing being understood not in a negative sense, but in the sense of another kind of being completely. A being which is completely one. He, interestingly, here, and this is based on other stuff that's pages we skipped, yeah, that when there's something, there's division. Yeah, there is division. Uh, and the goal, the goal is to turn back from that division to the primordial unity. And that he calls decreating, if you don't like the term. It doesn't mean destroying. He's, he's definitely not saying destroying. It's Decreating, which is a made-up word, which I think expresses quite neatly the pattern of thought that, that he's using. Um, but that, that's his word, so you don't have to be wedded to it. Um, <laughs> right? Um, now, um, hmm. right, I do want to do the conclusion of this whole section. Um, he talks about the Sabbath. We're not going to read all about the Sabbath. What are we? Um, hmm. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. All right. Let's let's. Can you can you put up with another four pages or so before yeah. we have a break? Yeah. All right. Let's this do is that. The break, tea time, or just a break? This was just going to be a short break, okay. but if it goes on too long, it might have to be the end. Okay. I don't know. No, I think. I mean, yeah. Right, so I'm, I'm just going to summarise a bit. He talks now about, so Jesus is 
in the words of Henri de Lubac, um, the reality of Shabbat. Shabbat, the Sabbath for Jews, especially in Jewish mysticism, has a messianic overtone. The Sabbath is the, the day of return, when everything returns to its origin, when all work, all creation ceases and everything comes to rest back in God, as it were. Um, and so, yeah. Could that be re the rest you refer to, the Jubilee year, the long rest of the year, could that be... Could that be tied in with with uh, hatred and division to disappear? That uh, you know the um, is there a connection there, or am I making something that doesn't? I think it makes a lot of sense what you're saying that the, the jubilee as the okay. ultimate great return, and that's certainly spoken of in those terms, um, both in ancient uh, apocalyptic literature, book of jubilees, that sort of thing, but also in later Jewish mysticism, the yovel when everything returns to how it was in the beginning. I said it to my atheist son in Words of Great Wonder, and he said, had they never heard of crop rotation? <laughs> okay, good. So, he pursues this idea of the Sabbath as this symbol of the great return of everything to God. And then, let's, so let's pick it up on page 91, along the lines of the Besht and the Magid of Mesrich. And he returns now to this Rav Meshulam Faibishov's Barrage, whom I have to confess I know next to nothing about, but I should know more clearly because um, he's kind of introduced me to this great Siddic writer. So, from along the lines of the Besht, that's the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, and the Magid of Mesrich, the second generation. Okay, whose go is it? Oh, two is. Rabbi Meshulam Fagish. Just the letter of the Sabbath. Yes. The Sabbath is called by mm -hmm. a name that means restitution because there is no subs subsistence for any created thing in the world that is foreign to, to the will of the name, blessed be he. For nothing has existence. Has its own existence. Sorry, has you its need own the, the square brackets yeah, are needed. needed yeah. Yeah. For nothing has its own existence since all things were created after the absence. The, empt the emptiness left in God, if one can say thus, by the tzitzum, the, rest, the restriction. This is a, this is a uh, deep Kabbalistic concept that in order for anything to exist other than God, God had to create a sort of void, empty of God, to allow something else to exist. It's a nice parallel, incidentally, to the kenosis, the Christian idea of emptying out. But it's an idea that specific, it has its hints in the Middle Ages, but it becomes central to Kabbalistic thinking only in the 16th century. So it's quite late in the day. The 16th century is a tinsum of, of God withdrawing himself, creating space for something other. Then there's controversies. Did God really withdraw? Or did God only withdraw, only hide his light, but not really withdraw? So there are different approaches to what this really means. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, then. All things were preceded by the absence. And for everything preceded by the absence, it is impossible to subsist other than by the will of the name, blessed be he, who himself subsists forever, who is there for everything, who is eternal without a past or future death. As to the creatures, they were in his will. They come from the fact that he wanted them to be. Without his will, they, were, they are nothing and have no existence, as they, as they had none before he came to, to will them to be. And his will regarding the creatures is the enjoyment he awakes from them when they attach themselves to their root through their desire. And it is through this that they subsist before they attach themselves to him, while he is eternal and subsisting. Thus it is still necessary that the creatures fulfill his will, that they do what he wants the, of them in such a way that his will is realized. And that the creature might be, but the creatures have no existence except by the subsistence of his will in them. But what that will wants, which is that the creatures attach themselves to their root, is impossible. For through creation itself, the creatures are at a distance from their root. As was mentioned above, they have distanced themselves because that is the constituted bodily state of men. 
Because of this, men have detached themselves from the root, that is, the spiritual state and the unity of the one. This occurred after the creation, the creation willed by the name, blessed be he, so that they might subsist. But they could not respond to that will because of their distancing from him. That is why he illuminated their will in the world with the clarity that comes from what he is in himself, blessed be he, through an emanation that is of weak intensity. Then men are filled with the desire and the will that, is, that are directed to him. This is like a small child who acts according to his age and forgets his father. And afterwards, when he sees his father, because of the great desire he has to be with his father, he rejects everything and detaches himself to him. He runs to him because he is part of the parts of his father. Thus it is so to speak with the name, blessed be he. He projects the splendor of his magnificence upon the creatures. Then their faces are turned towards him in a great desire. And that is his will. That is what he hopes for from them. That is the cause of, of their subsistence for two reasons, as, as was mentioned above. This is the reality of the Sabbath, which is restitution to the root. The root sheds its light on the branches, and the branches desire it. They find their delight in it, and they long for it. That in union, uh, that in union. That is union. Sorry, that. Yeah. <laughs> that is union with the name, blessed be he. Okay. That's difficult, isn't it? Yes. Are you lost? Yeah? He'll, he'll, he's going to comment on that now. So let's just carry on. We'll come, we'll come back to clarify if necessary. This message expressed in the form of a spiral with repetitions. This message expressed in the form of a spiral with repetitions that bring about an advance towards a conclusion is typical of the history. Hasidic master's style, its heaviness, its imperfection in a Hebrew that reflects the original Yiddish, makes an explanation difficult and useless. It develops at length in Besht's elliptic teaching that we heard in the preceding text. It continues this teaching and ends in union with the name, a union that is very much that suggested in the last prayer of Shabbat. Rabbi Shulman dared to say that the Sabbath, as we often practice by Israel, leads to Israel's union with God. Such an affirmation is one of the exceptions that confirms the rule, according to which the masters consider attachment yes. to God to be more, more to be more communion with God than union. Okay, so we're going to. Um just pause there, because we're going to go, go on in a, in a moment, but this is, this is a point that um, yeah, I felt the need to comment on. So, Rabbi Meshulam Fabish has, has, has depicted the Sabbath as this great process of return to God, a process that comes about through God shining upon the people and awakening in them the desire to return to Him. Reading it in this context with you or with this with Pierre Lenhardt, uh, it, it, you know, it has big overtones for me of Christian discussions about grace. Mm. Yeah? yeah, how you know we're separated from God. Um, how do we get back there? Can we do it on our own? Uh, Christians normally say no. Yeah, we need God's grace. Jews generally don't deal with those sorts of questions, but if they do, they say no. We just observe the commandments. But the deeper mystical teaching in Judaism is, no, you do need God's grace. Without that, our separation will become absolute. You need that light, that will of God drawing you in, in order to be able to respond and make that move back to God. But that's just a side comment. That's not the main point. Okay, so the main point here is, this returning back to God is portrayed as a union with God. And now he points out that received wisdom in Jewish scholarship is that Judaism does not teach the possibility of union with God. There is a word devekut, which means clinging or cleaving or adhering, um, and is used a great deal in the mystical and spiritual literature. But the great 
doyen of scholars of Jewish mysticism, Gershom Sholem, who is quoted in the footnote there, Gershom Sholem, back in the early to mid 20th century, great, great scholar who pioneered the historical study of Jewish mysticism, asserts very forcefully that unlike Christian and Muslim mysticism, and let alone Eastern mysticisms, Judaism does not teach mystical union with God that the person, the human being, can somehow kind of completely lose their being and blend into God in an ecstatic, mystical union. Would that be because yeah. grace is freely given by God and doesn't require any Kabbalistic or mystical... No, no, because the word grace is a Christian word. I was bringing it in, but that's not, grace is not a concept that Jews ever okay. talk about. I mean, yes, in that other context, but... It's not relevant there, sorry. Um, so, yes, this uh, Gert Scholem's assertion, fruit of great expertise and knowledge of the text, was that Jews speak about clinging or cleaving to God, being joined onto God, but not becoming one with God. That there always remains a distinction. There is God and there is the person, and the two do not become one. They're always distinct. And this became a kind of received view that everybody accepted for decades. Yeah? But, and this is, he doesn't mention this, which I find interesting, um, in the 1980s, a new, a new school of thought about Jewish mysticism uh, began, particularly with a scholar called Moshe Idel. I-D-E-L, Moshe Idel, who came along and wrote a, a book called uh, um, um, Kabbalah, New Perspectives, um, in which he argues against many of the received views from Gershom Sholem, and especially, most famously, the view that there is no unio mystica in Judaism. And Idel goes back to the texts, the Kabbalistic and Hasidic texts, and, and shows that there is a lot of evidence of, of a real idea of the complete swallowing up of the soul within God, a complete union where the individual loses their identity and becomes one with God. And this is not like Sholem said, that they always remain distinct. So, there's, there's, so it's interesting that he uh, sort of acknowledges Gershom Sholem's view, as far as I can tell, and it comes up a few other times as well, he's not really aware of Idel's scholarship. I'd love, uh, it's not that he wrote this anyway. It'd be very interesting to discuss that with him and see what he thought about it. Because Idel, yeah, certainly Jewish mystics don't speak about it quite as openly as Christian mystics do about that experience of union. But uh, Idel argues that it's very much there if you know how to read the text correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, so, in other words, what he goes on to say in the next paragraph is, well, here there is a real union, and that's something that I think where well, he, in a way, is echoing what he dealt with say, mm -hmm. that the truth is not restricted to what Gershom Sholem said. Now, I'm sorry if that sounds a bit like, oh, well, one Jewish scholar, another Jewish scholar, but it's a really important development in contemporary Jewish understanding of, of our own tradition. Is that linked, Mark, to what he said here, communion and yeah. union? Yeah, so yeah. union means a complete union. Communion would mean being with, but not but completely one with. Yeah. And only in this life, in this material world. Which is not like. That's another interesting question, oh, which well, let's leave that for now, because that, that adds another dimension, and it's a very important discussion. But it's not one that he really goes into here, so we'll leave that for today. Okay. So the Sabbath prayer, let's see what he has goes on. We did say we'd have a break. And Where? The Sabbath prayer suggests that union is possible. Is possible. Yeah. So it, page 892, and it's the uh, third paragraph down, more or less, the Sabbath prayer suggests. That yeah. union is possible. This prayer, after teaching creation in the evening and revelation in the morning, proclaims redemption in the afternoon in the Mina liturgy. The central blessing is the Mina liturgy. In the Mina liturgy, 
the square built with reality to which Israel comes through its observance. In its beginning, the blessing offers a ternary formulation that is very suggestive for a study of unity to Israel. Okay, now we have to skip because I'm you know, we're really going to run over. He, he then quotes this blessing from the Sabbath afternoon service. Uh, very beautiful service. Hardly anybody goes to it, but it's a very beautiful service. And the special blessing in that, which is different from any other service, has this formulation. You are one and your name is one. And who is like your people, Israel, one people on the earth? Now, however else one might question this, he's linking these ones, God is one, God's name is one, Israel is one. How many ones do we have? Yeah. Three ones which are all one. Okay, that's what he's heading for here, we, won't, we don't need to read all the way through it, but he, he discusses this uh, beautifully, and then finally uh, he um, he gets to the, the point, which is kind of the climax of part one of the book. So that's how, how far we've got. Uh, the climax of part one uh, on page 93. Um, Unity, the Jewish Trinity. Let's just read this bit because it's worth looking at. Okay, and then we'll have a break, I promise. Okay, this resonance. This resonance also comes out in what the great great scholar Jacob Salel Lauterbach uh, wrote in his day on the Jewish Trinity, which will serve us as a conclusion to this first part. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Um, well, yes, if you want to. Or... We shall therefore consider primarily how the Pharisees understood the three central concepts of Judaism, God, Israel, and the Torah which are fundamental doctrines in Judaism, or, as one might call them, the Jewish Trinity. For the understanding and interpretation of these three concepts decides the character of Judaism and determines all its aspects, its laws and rituals, its beliefs and practices. These three ideas are in Judaism intimately connected with one another, and in Jewish thought they are inseparable. To use the words of an older Jewish mystic, while these three are separate and distinct concepts, they are almost like one, in that they are bound together and cannot be separated from one another. In other words, these three ideas hang together and are inextricably interwoven. Thank you. Well, I would like to put a base his words on the text of the Shabbat prayer we just looked at. Well, this text begins with the prayer, the Holy One, the Blessed be He, God. The name Israel. The so, Bible. God, name Israel. It's it's not always clear when you're reading it. So, just yeah, God, the name, and Israel. Israel. Yeah. A prayer that corresponds with the prayer, God, Israel, the Torah, which Lightback calls the Jewish Trinity. In fact, we have two equivalent prayers that are known and perceived by Israel. God, name, Israel, in the Shabbat prayer. God, Torah, Israel, in the Zohar and Pasadim, in the Good. Good. It really is necessary to speak of triads. Triads make up the dyad God, name God, Okay, let me clarify, sorry, uh, let me clarify that if I may, because the, this language is confusing. So it's triads made up of a dyad, which is God and name, or God and Torah. So in other words, name and Torah are the same, are the same thing there. God and name, or God and Torah. What does, just to clarify, what is God and name? What's this distinction between God and and the name of God. What do you think is going on there? What does a name do? The name, yes, is how you recognize someone. A name reveals the identity, doesn't it? A name reveals or signals the identity. You can be there, but unless you have a name, then nobody can get a real handle on your identity. And how do we get a handle on God's identity? 
the Torah. That's what he's suggesting here. The Torah is God's naming of himself through which we know who God is and what God does. Yeah? Yeah, so God name or God Torah is the same dyad, the same double doubling. Yeah? Please carry on. A third term, Israel. And the third term, Israel, that is declared to be one like the first two terms of the triad. However, one cannot treat Israel as one in the same way as are without doubt God and the name, God and the Torah. Thus it is not permitted to speak of a perfectly unified triad as a Jewish trinity should, should be, according to that. Okay. In other words, he's saying Israel is not a dyad. It's not part of that primary dyad. It's a kind of third bit that is somehow distinct from the first two. This is something he's going to wrestle with in the later sections of the book. Okay, because there, he, what he's identifying is there is a tension here. There's a, a problem. It's not doesn't. They're not quite three equal things here because Israel is clearly not God and not God's name. It's something else. So, yeah. But let's stick with the triad for a minute, whatever the case may be. Whatever the case may be, since the creation of the world, God, the Torah, Israel, constitute the fundamental triad. Israel, responsible for revelation, the beginning of the harvest, makes this triad known <coughs> to the nations. God and the Torah are one, single reality, and Israel is a witness to it. With the end of this first part, it seems to me that it is useful to sum up the triads or Jewish trinities that we have already encountered. I shall arrange them with a look to the Christian triad or trinity. I shall speak of this triad trinity in the third part. In order to arrive there, I would invite the reader to first listen in the second part to the message of Israel's tradition on the number one, two, three, and on their place on, in the unity. The texts in the second part of the, of the second part will show up two dyads, God and God Shekinah, the divine presence in the world, the Shekinah and the Holy Spirit, as well as several triads that approach the Christian Trinity without them being the same. <coughs> The work will end with a third part on the Christian formulation of the Trinity, resonating with the message of Israel's tradition. Okay, and finally. So, recapitulation of the triads. Triads or Jewish trinities. God, name, Israel. God, Torah, Israel. God, Um, we, we haven't actually seen those bits, but if you've read the, the whole of this lengthy chapter before, which we've just read a little bit, he constantly refers ahead. He says, see at the end of this where I recapitulate the triad. So he's constantly pointing you forward to this little bit at the end of the chapter, which kind of sums up a whole lot of very complex discussion where the terms within the triad can sort of shift from one thing to another, and he's tried to explain how what those shifts mean and what the what the inner dynamic is. Um, but there we are. We'll leave it there for for now. Oh God, it's quarter past already. I'm sorry. We'll have we'll have tea, and then I and then I think we're going to skip the next bit I chose, and we're going to go to Pentecost, and we're going to finish the day with the Pentecost section. Okay.